Oh, hello, world. It's me, Dan Shaheen. Welcome to Comic Book News. Oh, man, I'm sitting in not my usual studio setting. I'm sitting in the lap of luxury. Not many of you people know, but uh, the proceeds from Comic Book News have made me independently wealthy to the point where, you know, I really don't have to care about my common man anymore because all I really care about is making that money. You know what I mean? Maybe you don't because most of us are probably not in that scenario. But there seems to be a growing group of people at the top of this country maybe that are and 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 there's sort of a philosophy in this country and and heck maybe even all over the world that money is the most important thing and that uh everything good will follow the love of money right if we follow that if we take capitalism to its extreme that will uh that that rising tide will lift all boats well not everybody thinks that's 100 percent accurate i'm one of them and I got a guest tonight uh, who feels the same way, but this is not just any guest. This is, um, you know, I want to call him a, a legend. I use that word sometimes, but like this is a guy who for a really, really long time has been writing comics to educate people. And we're not talking about just maybe on his opinions, but we're talking about comics pedagogy. We're talking about using the art form of comics to teach. That's what uh, Larry Gonick does. You've probably heard of the Cartoon History of the Universe, Volumes 1, Volume 2. You may have heard of the Cartoon History of the United States. Maybe you've seen some of his cartoon guides. Cartoon Guide to Physics, Statistics, Environment, Genetics, Biology, and Calculus. Man, and there's probably a couple that I might have even forgotten about. So we're going to talk to this guy. We're going to see uh, how did he go from being a, somebody who taught Calculus at Harvard to somebody who makes his living writing, drawing, creating comics to teach. So without further ado, I want to bring in, and I'm super pleased because I've been a fan of his work almost as long as I can read. Um, let's bring in Larry Gonick. Welcome to Comic Book News, Larry. Uh, thanks, Dan. You made me feel really old. <laughs> oh, man. I didn't mean to do that, but, uh, you know. But I am. Right? It's okay. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. Let's go from being old to being a legend, Larry. Let's talk about, um, man, how did you get to do what you do? Because y you are the guy. I mean, when it comes to comic books that teach people specific things that they would normally learn in a classroom, I that you're the, the name that comes to mind. So tell me, how did this all start? How did you get into this thing? Well, you know, it was the 60s. It was a combination of the 60s and the 60s. Uh, I was a grad student um, at Harvard, majoring in math. Um, I had actually just come back from from a year uh, in India. That kind of made my turn my head ninety degrees, and I had been drawing a bit. Um, and it so happened that uh, someone I knew told me that his brother was looking for an illustrator for a project that he he had. So this guy named Steve Atlas came to visit me and he, he had been in Latin America for a year and he had seen these uh, pedagogical comics by a Mexican cartoonist named Rius, who's not much known in the United States, but he's one of the great cartoonists. You know, he's, uh, he's I think he's still alive, actually. He must be pushing 90, but he's this incredibly brilliant cartoonist in the sort of Latin American, European vein, quick draw, you know, very, very skilled draftsman, um, very funny. And his stuff was hardcore educational. You know, he did political comics. He did a 24 page comic in color every week. He had a staff. So Steve had sat down with himself and said, you know, the, uh, the, yeah, Los Agachados, um, there he is. Eduardo Del Rio is his real name. Beautiful. So, yeah. And, uh, yeah, this doesn't really capture it, though. Look for Cuba for Beginners. That's the okay. book. That, that was the, the great book. So Steve saw that this was a, a genre that didn't exist in the United States, and he wanted to uh, 
There you go. Old PDF somewhere. And yeah, there's there's the uh, there's the cover here. Click one of these interior pages. Yeah. yeah pretty cool. Yeah, it's a wonderful style. Oh, um, I see. I this is I see cartoon yeah. history uh, of cartoon everything. Guy. That's right. I ripped off his format. I can't draw yeah. as well as he did, though. I mean, this guy works at lightning speed. Um, can I digress already? We just got started. I was once at the San yeah, Diego. Yeah, you digress. This is my show. We talk about what we want. I was I was at the San Diego Comics Convention once. Um, my only time. I was sitting across the table from uh, Sergio Aragones, and he, we were talking about Rios and Aragones sort of went on this thing about how it's you know necessary to draw rapidly, but also authentically, right? And sitting across from me, he drew. He gets out his pen and he's going like this, right? At a zillion miles an hour, he draws this character in full Japanese armor upside down, right? So that I, for me, right? So that's, you know, uh, in that uh, low income economy, I think that's the speed you got to go at. Anyway, so back to the story. So Steve yeah. uh, wanted to do a comic like that. You know, it was, it was the year would have been about 1969 or 1970. Um, the 60s were in full swing. Everybody thought the revolution was around the corner. Uh, there was an enormous upheaval in the way people thought about um, politics, education, and political education in particular. And uh, so Steve sat down and he wrote down a list of 10 different topics. And he picked the dullest one because he thought it needed the treatment the most. And that was tax reform. So he had written a script for a book on tax reform, and he brought it to me, uh, and I had been drawing, you know, for fun. That's why I was recommended to him. I, you know, I was under the influence of the undergrounds and George Gross and people like that. And I started work. I read, looked at the reuse books, you know, and I thought, wow, there's nothing like this. And I started working on this book, and it was like as they say in Massachusetts, dawn breaks over Marblehead. Um, you know, it was a revelation. I could, I saw I could do it. You know, it was suited to my talents. That is, it required research and explanation instead of just, um, you know, drawing and thinking of funny ideas. Right. And so we went ahead and, and did this project. And that was my first comic project. Um, later, he was peddling it around to various news outlets and media places in Boston. And um, uh, the upshot of that was, after a couple of intermediate steps, that the newspaper Boston After Dark uh, offered me a weekly comic strip. So that was, you know, when I got the weekly strip with the weekly paycheck, 25 bucks, uh, I dropped out of grad school. Yeah. What year was that? Uh, that would have been 1972. Okay, so you dropped out of Harvard grad school. Right. To draw comics. Yes. And then your parents said what? Um, my mother had some background in psychology, and she had, she was a teacher, and she knew that she, she, she understood, you know, that if you put up resistance, you were going to make it worse. Ah. So they they were very muted in their response. You know, my father's response was, couldn't you do this in your spare time? And uh, I kind of, I mean, the answer was no. I mean, it, you know, it's a very, very demanding medium to do this um, because there's all this research and writing and so on. Um, but, and, and, you know, drawing comics is slow work at first. Right. Every, every picture is a real picture. Of course, I got a lot faster as time went on, but but uh, you know I had the weekly strip going, and I kind of made an existence of it. And I never had to go. I, you know, I could have gone back to grad school if I had to, I suppose, but I didn't. So uh, that's one thing led to another, and led to another, and led to another. And my mother okay. ended up, you know, kind of peddling my comics. <laughs> she after the history of the universe came out, she'd go around with the comic books and you know, like a like a flasher, you know, and open up her thing and say, hey, see. <laughs> Yeah. Well, was that that now was the original cartoon history when I saw it first? I saw it as a graphic novel that collected volume one issues, I guess, one through seven. What was the original format, publisher? Where did that thing come out? Because there weren't really many, if any, comic book stores back then. Oh, traditional sure. 
traditional oh. bookstores didn't really carry comics. I mean, head shops carried independent and underground stuff. That might even be where I first saw your comics. Might have been in like a head shop or something. So how did that stuff sell to begin and, and how did it come about? Well, the original idea, okay, so I did this before the history of the universe, I did a strip uh, called Yankee Almanac. And that was my first sort of uh, overground thing I did. So I did, I did this weekly strip for Boston After Dark, which became the Boston Phoenix uh, after, uh, after it bought the competition. So I worked for the Phoenix and then uh, we had a union drive there and uh, everybody who was active in the uh, union drive eventually got laid off with one or two exceptions. And uh, so I was, you know, casting about for something to do, um, which you could do in those days. By the way, my rent was thirty-seven dollars a month, ah. sharing a sharing a room in a in a thirteen-person commune in Cambridge. And uh, <clears throat> and so the bicentennial was coming and I wanted to do a bicentennial comic book. I thought, you know, this is something you could sell at, it would be a point of sale item. At, you know, we're in Boston, you go to the USS constitution or the tea party of a tea party ship and sell these comics. Sure. Sure. So I did a little proposal for it and I couldn't get anywhere and I, I'm not very entrepreneurial. Um, you know, didn't consider self publishing and so on. Um, and somebody told me that the, there was somebody I should talk to at the Boston Globe. So I went to the Globe and uh, there was a woman there named Nina McCain who had been tasked by the editor to do a bicentennial children's feature. She was completely um, nonplussed. She had no idea what to do. So I was like a lifeline for her. So I showed it to her and, you know, I was going to bail her out. Um, so she and this other woman who were supposed to be doing this thing pitched me really hard to the editor. Um, yeah, I think they're all nervous because of the leftist politics they'd seen in, in the Boston comics and the Globe, I mean, in the, in the Phoenix, but, uh, but they gave me the job. So I did this thing during a bicentennial. And of course, it was a history of colonial Massachusetts and the American Revolution. And it ran out, you know, uh, ran for a year or four months. And I came to the end of my subject matter. And, and that was the end of that job. So I thought I got to, you know, First, I was just doing things that explain politics or political essays, nonfiction. I did some secondhand reportage too, but but history worked really well. You know, it's got stories in it, it's got humor, although most people don't seem to realize it. Uh, and uh, comics are a great way to bring that history, that that humor out too. Yeah. So I uh, I thought this is. A, the Sunday strip, you know, so I conceived it as a Sunday strip and I had invented a layout actually. Um, it was like three book pages with a footnote at the bottom. Um, was it colored? Know. Yeah. Color. The, the, the globe thing was at the top of the, the top half page of the Sunday, uh, comics for that. Wow. Period. Nice. Above the fold yeah. in the comic section, huh? Above the fold in the comic section. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is still true or if you, you or your the viewers know this, but um, Sunday comics have to be displayable in three different layouts, a quarter page, a third of a page, and a half a page. And there, there's a standard way to do that. And I invented a non-standard way to do it. So the three pages formed the third page and then with a header and a footnote, they form a half page. So this, that's how this, this uh, idea of using the footnote that's half uh, the inspiration. Which they, could, which they could include or leave out depending on the layout of the right. paper. That's right. the idea with right. Exactly. And if, the, if the footnote was split in three, you could stack it up and that would give you your, yeah. your, your quarter, your yeah, quarter page. Yeah. <clears throat> Anybody who reads the Sunday comics knows about sometimes you see three strips and the top one is kind of often the title and like a little throwaway panel or right. gag. It was a two panel throwaway gag, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then editors have the right, because of course, who should dictate the way a comic is laid out? The artist or somebody like who's pasting things up, right? So that they can fit Ziggy into the corner with your thing. I always well, felt it, 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 was, it depends on whether they're running more. I mean, it, it's all moot now. It's like, you know, it's a wasteland out there now. It, it's a, a comics desert, the newspaper business. Well, that was one of the great things, not to digress, but 
that Bill Watterson of Calvin and Hobbes, he made that as the condition of his return after his hiatus was that he was allowed to have one format, a tabloid format, one box that he could break up any way he wanted, and they had to run the whole thing. And a That's few other shirts followed in on that, but it didn't really catch on as the primary no, format. I didn't really. So I tried to follow this format with the with the uh, with. So I, I developed this idea for a world history series, and yep. and you know did I think I don't know, a whole bunch of strips. Um, and took him down to this, like the world's only cartoonist agent at that time, a woman named Tony Mendez. She was a retired Rockette. She was a very petite woman who wore leopard skin pillbox hats. And um, she was Milton Kniff's agent. And, you know, I mean, she oh, was- Oh, that's a name I've never heard. Say that name again. Tony Mendez, T-O-N-I-M-E-N-D-E-Z. I I so I went down to New York, you know, and she says, don't bring me any Sunday strips. Don't bring me any Sunday strips. You can't sell them unless there's a daily strip. Space is at a premium, blah, blah, blah. No continuity. Don't bring me any continuity, she says. So here I am with continuity in a Sunday strip. So, you know, so I'm wandering around with that. And then I guess it was summer and I was going out to San Francisco and I saw that, that Gilbert Shelton and Ted Richards had done a, a, uh, a bicentennial comic book um at ripoff press in san francisco yeah so i was in san francisco and with great trepidation i called gilbert and i say with great trepidation because i consider him to be you know one of the really great cartoonists he's up there in the pantheon you know uh very underrated in my mind too although i hope that's going to change now that there's a freak brothers cartoon coming to netflix yeah i i from well from what I've seen of that cartoon, I'm not so sure, but okay. but the original Free Brothers are, are are great, and you know he was practically the only person in the underground who could make you fall out of your chair laughing. Absolutely, you know, he's a great gag cartoonist and storyteller, and you know he's and he really knows the medium. So I called him up and I went over to Rip Off Press, and um, and he looks at my stuff. You know I had done this this. American Revolution thing, and he says, "Oh, this is the way to do history comics. You know, we'll publish. You know, anything you want to do." So that's where they. That's what happened. You know, as I I start doing the history of the universe for ripoff. So it was sold through the through the underground comics uh, um, distribution chain, whatever it was. <laughs> there were, you know, this was this was nineteen seventy. Eight, so uh -huh. the underground was actually mostly dead by then. Right, and there wasn't right. much happening. All the underground cartoonists were wandering around, you know, wringing their hands. Uh, Ted Richards, who I shared a studio with when I came out here, you know, he he got a job working for Skateboarder Magazine doing a strip, and Spiegelman had gone off to New York and was, you know, doing that. And Gilbert was still doing what he did, and he was successful. You know, the Freak Brothers kept that whole operation. Right. Um, in uh, in business, um, I don't know if Crumb had left for France. Maybe not quite yet. But you know, I, 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 not, not, not. but but the but the distribution network was there. Um, I wasn't super undergroundy, you know. Although there was, I put dinosaur sex in because I was in the undergrounds. I could do that, um, and. Uh, um, and and are we talking about we're talking about cartoon history of the universe right now, right? Yeah, that's what we're. That's what yeah, we're talking the first, about. Uh, the first seven comics, yes, forty-page comics. That's that's the collection of the first seven. Those were all, those were all, um, and I think maybe two, two or three more after that were all uh, uh, forty-eight-page black and white comics published by Ripoff. A great series. That's how I think I remember first seeing it. Although I am, it's been a long time, and yeah. uh, and. And I do remember seeing the issues and it was probably in a head shop, which makes perfect sense if you were coming out from rip off and still being distributed along with Freak Brothers and everything else. Those shops, besides just having whatever stone or stuff, they also tended to carry countercultural leftist literature, that kind of thing. And and uh, I think your stuff fit, fits right in in the sense that I, you can look at it. And when I look at it, the first thing I saw, I thought was, well, he's obviously under influence. I didn't see the Rios influence because I didn't know about that guy, but. 
I said, this seems influenced by underground comics. Right. Um, that, so, so, so tell me, I yeah. want to go back a second. I want to go back from pre Larry as an author to pre to Larry as a, as a comic fan. Okay. I want to know what you read that just informed you as a cartoonist. And I know one of them for sure that you tipped me off to, and you've got something to show for this too. I just want to show this. What, what, what can you tell us about this? Well, let's, I mean, this is, this comes later, you know, this is, I mean, Oh, this is later. Well, this is, I'm a kid, you know, but I'm reading yeah. Classics Illustrated. I'm reading Donald Duck. I'm reading uh, Mad, you know, the classic Mad, the comic book. Although I, I was, I'm a little too old to have actually had the comic book, a little too young to have had the comic books, uh, but the collections were coming out of the, yeah. you know, the Jack Davis, Wallace Wood, and Bill Elder stuff, um, and, uh, and, and Pogo. Preeminently, you know, Pete Pogo's that fits perfectly. My yeah, ideal. Makes, yeah. Um, so that you know, that's that's what I liked. Um, the uh, and when I saw the reuse stuff, I thought, you know, what I I want to use this approach, but I don't want to, you know. First of all, I don't have the f facility or tradition in my head to draw, you know, in that style, I wanted to look a more American. So I, you know, Kelly had drawing with a brush, you know, that's the, that's, that's what makes it look like that. And that's why you didn't see reuse in the history of the universe, because it's all drawn with a brush. Um, um, the cartoon guides are drawn with a pen and they look more like it, although not quite the same. So, uh, so Kelly, yeah. So then, as I was telling you, the, uh, the, um, when I was about 11, this thing, the, the amazing story of measurement showed up probably in the school. It's an industrial comic. So you can see they're published by the Lufkin Rule Company. Um, and so I show the interior page. I've got one. So we yeah, let me, let, me, let me bring that to the screen. Let me pull this down. Yeah. Okay. So what am I going to do? Do I have to do anything? Oh, we're showing it. Yeah, it's showing it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you know, it's got these this zappy type treatment, and and it's even though it's very text heavy, um, yeah. it's kind of entertaining, right? It's telling you you couldn't Great sell eggs. It was a crime to sell eggs by a dozen, right? It's got a picture of a, j a, a egg dealer in jail and stuff, um, and so you know, I thought that was really cool. I, um, you know, imagine if there were spies going around enforcing. The metric system might happen, <laughs> might happen yeah. Um, well, I, I I like it. I mean, it doesn't. I haven't seen much more on the inside. I saw a couple of interior panels. It seemed very text heavy, like you're saying. Yours yeah. leaned more towards a. I mean, there's not a lot of panel to panel continuity in your no. work. Let's say not a lot, tiny bits. Tell me a little bit about your approach. I mean, is, are we coming from a full script? The way I imagine it is, is that most of the caption boxes are in the script from your author, and then you sort of like incorporate the gags and the layouts. But you tell me, please. Huh. If only it were so simple. Well, the cart first, the cartoon history, you know, there is no co-author. It's all me. So let's talk about the way that's made. Because um, that looks like a comic book. Variable size panels, you know, some graphic continuity, uh, not enough. But the fact is that unlike a lot of comics, it's all, it all starts with text. You know, I may have some little gag ideas or drawing, you know, something I want to show, but these stories are so, it, you know, it's so essential to keep to the narrative that it all starts with text. So first it's a draft and then, and then it's a second draft and then it's a third draft and every draft is getting shorter and shorter and shorter until, you know, the final draft is maybe 30% the length of the, of the first one. Um, and what I always like to say is in that final squeezing out, um, hidden connections appear. And, and that's where a lot of the humor comes. Mm -hmm. um, as, you, as you start stripping out details, I mean, in effect, what's happening is the story is like, it's the minimal, it's the skeleton. It's like, it is to the story what a caricature is to a portrait, right? Um, 
you're taking the story and you're you, you, in order to make it fit in a comic book, you have to throw out everything, everything that doesn't have to be there. And everything that is there does have to be there. In order to see everything that has to be there, you have to understand the connections between all of the parts, right? And sometimes you don't see those at first. So when you see those, you know, little insights, and you can yeah. you can sort of nail those down with a, with, you know, with a remark. Um, so that's you know that's how the basic narrative is created, and then and then I work in the layouts. Um, yeah. Now, the question of graphic continuity is a difficult one. You know, I always, I mean, I, I'm very sensitive to that. I understand that it's insufficient or it's, it's much less than it is in the normal comic book. So as much as possible, I try and make a six-page story, you know, where there is at least a little story with a regular development in the, in the normal comics way. But, but oftentimes it's just you know, topic, 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 illustration, illustration. And that can be very challenging because you don't know always exactly what you want to, you know, what should go there. Sure. I mean, I thought it was really interesting, um, at least in Hypercapitalism, your latest book, and I know you do this in other books too, is you to sort of created a cast of characters to represent, iconic representation of groups, I guess, of people that you boil down into the essence of one caricature if you will of that um persona john q public <laughs> right sure that would be, but you get a little bit more specific right and you have the yeah. capitalist character cappy and you have um several others right and you use that you use them as metaphors and their interactions with each other to sort of like lay bare your pro the, the 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 thesis i suppose that you're trying to right so there's a there's a uh, a character there's a consumer you know who's only interested in buying. There's a worker. Uh, there's a small business owner, entrepreneur. Cappy is the finance capitalist. You know the guy, yeah. who, the modern capitalist. And then there's there's uh, Algae, the amalgamated gigantic corporation. This yes. character I had in the bank. I used him many many years ago for some strips I used to do. Who's this? Uh, you know, segmented uh, caterpillar like thing a thousand arms doesn't know sort of a, it. sort of a human centipede if you it almost right yeah right. i wouldn't I, that's a movie i wouldn't recommend seeing by the way if you've never seen. okay yeah I would stay away from that okay yeah so tell me more about Hi, let's go into hypercapitalism okay i want to talk we well, I, we're not here to review all your old books and we know that when it comes to learning something i, I want to bring up one i want to bring up my favorite okay of all your books that I've read anyway, I haven't read every one of them, but man, do I come back to this one again and again and again. Uh -huh. um, well, as a gambler, as a gambler and a gamer, right? I beg pardon? I said, as a gambler and a gamer, uh -huh. I go to that book quite a bit to like, when I look up statistical, um, I try to do st some statistical equations occasionally in my work too, I, do, I need to do some statistics. and. I'll often go, I'll Google it, I'll look for it, and then I'll go, what, how did Larry break this down? And I go to that book and I go, okay, it makes a lot more sense. Tell me that, like, what you identified was almost that the cartooning process for you, and I think this is true universally for cartoonists, is it's not so much as what you're putting on the page, almost as what you're not, or what you're stripping away, you're pulling out all the non-essential detail. And in your style, it's even per particularly more sparse in detail, if you will. Like if nothing looks photorealistic, no. but a couple of pictures, you look kind of close. But uh, but but when we see those, the 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 less realistic, I believe, the more we can identify right. with the character sure. that you're seeing. So yeah. Um. Well. I mean, I don't have too much to say about the graphic style of that book. You know, yeah. um, in itself, that is to say, you know, it's very similar to the graphic style of um, of all the cartoon guides. Um, the, I mean, you know, I, look, the first thing about that book and and any of the successful cartoon guides, and that's the most successful of all of them. Statistics. Um, yeah, 
uh, it's the most successful because it's it's a course it's a, it's it's a it's a course that a lot of people have to take in many yeah. different disciplines and and is generally you know considered a ball buster and all of the statistics professors are all looking for a better way to teach it and you know it's it's a tough one um and it was it's honestly one of the most important if not the most important math class i ever took i find it it helps me every day there is there is still a statistics blog that i follow every almost every day there's a guy in at columbia named andrew gelman uh, oh. who who who, who's a Bayesian, whatever that means, uh, who runs a blog called, um, let's see, social science, causal inference, something cause, something statistical significance, causal inference in the social sciences. Right? And yeah. he's a, he's a critic of statistical practice. And it's very, very interesting. He's a very oh, guy and he writes really well. Um, That's a bad piece of mine. The use of misleading statistics to make a, a point is really something that bothers me. I see, and you see it all the time. Yeah, and not to mention statistical malpractice. But um, what I was going to say is, you know, behind that book, you know, is not me. There's Wilkins Smith, the, st the statistics professor. Yes. Those explanations yes. are his explanations. Yes. You know, I mean, when you say does does the co-author write the text and then I put in the jokes and do the illustrations, the answer to that question is no, because just like me, the the co-author can't write it short enough, right? So they, yes, he writes me a text, but um, the amount of struggle between that draft, you know, when it finally ends up on the page is just you wouldn't believe it. It's and it can be horrible. I mean, you know, Wilkin and I went around several times. But um, speaking of pages, this is an original page of art that I purchased from you, Larry. Look, and, and I that, signed it too. That's unusual. Signed, no extra charge. I got a signature. I want everybody else out there to know if you look up Larry Gonick and you go to his website, you can buy original art from Larry. There's, he's got a lot to offer at pretty reasonable prices too. So get them while they're hot, folks. Glad to, glad to hear you think so. Uh, <laughs> um, so sorry, I'm sorry. To, I, you know, I mean, look, I, yeah, I don't know. It's a, I can, <laughs> say, I can say various things about statistics, but as I say, well, look, know, look. that's a case of a book where, where the explanations were extremely good and they come from somebody who's not me. Um, you know, the, the amount of, of hassle and rewrite you know, that goes on between me and the co-author varies from book to book. The only book I've done where, it, you know, the script came to me pretty much usable as his was the Cartoon Guide to Physics. Um, you know, he, he could write concisely. Um, yeah, uh, Art Huffman. The, uh, another one who was extremely good was, the, was Craig Criddle, the, you know, who did the Cartoon Guide to Chemistry with me. Um, that has some, you know, really unusually uh, tasty explanations. You know, he had the idea. This and this is not in any chemistry class. You know, he had the idea to illustrate, introduce chemical reactions by putting two people on a desert island, and seeing what they could make out of the seaweed, the sand, the clay. You know, and it turns out you can get quite a lot. You can build a house. You can make whitewash. You can make fireworks, and so on. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, somebody gives you that, you're golden. Um, Sorry, so, I, don't have, I don't have that cover handy for you. But I'm going to get that one. So um, in statistics, you know, there's there's this idea of sampling. That's what st statisticians do. You can't, you can't describe characteristics of an entire population because the population is so huge. So you look at a thousand members of it and you see what they are. Um, so I think he had said something like, let's get down to brass tacks. We have the, the, this, the tack company and some of the tacks are defective and some of them aren't, they're manufacturing tacks. And, and uh, so, you know, I, so I made the, uh, made the Hindu Swami sitting, sitting on, you know, I thought better nails, he's sitting on the tacks and some of the tacks attach themselves to his loincloth and he gets up and then that's your sample, right? You get, you get your uh, 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 okay, cool metaphor. And, I like that. And, and, and furthermore, um, to me, trained as a mathematician, 
statistics looks like one of the dark arts, you know, it doesn't look like math. It's a, it's a strange subject because um, it's all approximate and, and it's really about interacting with the real world and you know, on doing these, these measurements that have variable um, outcomes and trying to figure out what the distribution of outcomes is and stuff like that. And uh, um, um, so, you know, so the Swami's enlightenment over, you know, seeing these distributions mirrors, you know, what happens to me when I'm looking wow. at this crazy body of knowledge and say, oh, my God, it actually makes sense. You know, this is like, this is not the way I was trained to think. Um, uh, the, the K manifest says my favorite is the history of the universe always of the art in that one, which is interesting to me because it seems to me like there was a, a conscious change in your style between cartoon history of the universe one and two. Is that true or is that just no, it's not between one or two, it's between volume six and volume seven. Okay, tell me just tell it's us briefly one, about that. 48 page sequence that's different. Um, only that sequence in the middle, but it's or maybe it was just an the evolution. Last, it's the last wow. segment of the first book. It's the last forty-eight pages of the first book, the, the ancient Athens, the book on the segment on Athens. And what happened was, I remember it's looser. It's, 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 it's something. Um, <laughs> so I come. I I someone. I, uh, do you know who Lot is? L A T. Yeah. 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 So I've seen these. these, these Malaysian, another one, the world, you know, one of the world great cartoonists, Lot, yep. L-A-T, from Malaysia, um, who uh, did two books that are, you know, all-time masterpieces. It's Kampung Boy and Town Boy. Mm -hmm. um, there is a memoir of his childhood and uh, heavily influenced by Searle, by the way. I don't know if you have paid any attention to Lot, but... Uh, his early cartoons are kind of stiff. And then he took one of these world tours. If you could go, go back where you were and I'll show you the post Searle. So you see how, see how bendy those characters are. So he, mm -hmm. he took this round the world tour, maybe one of the state department tours, I don't know. And he met Searle and suddenly, you know, he took off his cartoons, his figures get like unbelievably expressive. Um, and so I love the way he draws, you know, and and then at the same time, I happened to run into my friend uh, Raymond Lorette, who drew under the late Raymond Lorette, who drew under the name of Norman Dog. You know, that name ring a bell? Uh, I don't know. Norman Dog. He was a very talented cartoonist back in the day, um, kind of a punk style. Uh, and he said something like, there's nothing that screams professional cartoonist like drawing with a brush he said contemptuously right <laughs> so so i thought let's you know i've been trying to draw with a pen you know so that's what happened i made the mistake of drawing those 48 pages mostly with a pen you know and kind of in imitation of lot and i wasn't that happy with you know i mean i went through the, to the end of the 48 pages but i wasn't thrilled with the outcome maybe that's yeah. what it must be I that when and the, then you went back to a brush. I'm, a definitely, I'm definitely a brush guy, but um, pens can, in the hands of the right art, can, can work great. Well, I'm getting a little feedback here. Sorry. Um, so, yeah. Uh, let me, let, let, let's move on here a little bit. I'm going to bring up, um, uh, let's move on to hyper -tackle. That's really, that's your latest. Uh, actually, um, it's my next to latest. I think the cartoon oh, guide to algebra came out after that, but that's okay. Oh, oh, oh okay. I thought this was 2020. 2020 no, yeah. no, 2018, maybe. Oh, okay, so, great. Sorry about that. It's all right. It's different enough from the others, you know. Right. Um, okay, so I'm, Larry, I might have to mute you for a second while I'm talking. While I talk, I'll, I'll mute you on and off because I'm getting a little echo here. Um, so uh so let's talk about hypercapitalism. I read this. I read it in a marathon session uh just the other day to pre in preparation for this. This seems very timely to me with what's going on. It seems to me like the effects of what you're talking about here, hypercapitalism have been building up for a very long time in, in our society and around the world. But why don't you just tell us and tell the audience what what is hypercapitalism? <laughs> 
Let me go get the book. <laughs> I, have to, I have to check. Hold on a second. <laughs> yeah. I'll pull up my, let me pull up my here, banner. Here, here, got again. Here, here again, you know, you got to remember there's a co author. Yeah. Tim Kasser, who taught a class in this. So let's see here. Because it seemed to me it was, it was less about, it's definitely not about politics, it's really a more of a sociological. Uh, exploration. Would you agree with that? Well, that in effect was part of my input into the book. That is to say, Tim, my co-author, is a psychologist by training. Um, so there's a critique of modern hypercapitalism, for want of a better word. Um, but neither one of us is an economist, you know, so I encouraged him to expand on and lay stress on the, the, uh, this question of what values it expresses. Yes. I mean, that's his, that's his area. And I was hoping actually that, you know, this would lead to an expansion of the terms of discussion. Um, because, you know, mostly, uh, Mostly when you talk about capitalism, you're talking about economics, but there's this extensive research on on values and the things people want out of life and what their goals and hopes and aspirations are. And, and you ask, you know, how well does your economic system conform with your values? And you yes, see that, yes. that uh, um, you know, in the very first place, whatever we're doing right now, um, is very weak on the question of how are we going to make this a better place for our children? You know, the next that generation, be it's that not be part of the, you know, it ain't in the constitution. It is in the, it, it is in the constitution of some places and, you know, in, in the traditions of some places. Uh, he cites the Iroquois nation, you know, but, that, um, um, that the, any decision that was made, you know, um, had to consider what the effect on future generations was going to be. We don't do that you know, to our peril, frankly, at this point. Um, so, so I like this idea, you know, of talking about about values. Tim's main, the, the thing that really sets him off um, is is advertising aimed at children, the commercialization, you know, the, the inculcation of commercial values in kids. And man, he showed me some things that I was unaware of um, that were just mind blowing. Um, there are these, I forget what they're called, unboxing or something. Do you know about this? Oh, uh, yeah. Videos on, on, on YouTube where all the person's doing is you have somebody with a pleasant voice who's, who's just unwrapping things for an hour and a half, and they get millions of children, you know, watching them unwrap stuff. And finding out what's inside these boxes and talking about how wonderful these little toys and dolls are, you know, um, it's really mind blowing. All right. It's almost a statement on like, you know, generating this consumerism, but then also so many, there's probably a lot of kids out there that maybe just can't afford and don't get presents a lot, but that is just like a vicarious thrill that they can sort of watch. I don't know that that's a positive. Uh, <laughs> Or not, you know. Yeah, um, I don't know. You know. we didn't get into that very much, although we certainly discuss income and asset inequality, which is. You know, well, you talk about the five moon. commandments. Right, that's what I was just getting the book. You know, thou shalt consume. Oh, number one, thou shalt not. Con thou shalt consume. Thou shalt consume, and there, you know, I was able to bring something to that, which is look up the word consume and remind ourselves that um, to cons. We, we now think of consuming as synonymous with buying. A consumer is somebody who buys things, but that's not what consuming is. Consuming is to, is to use something up and destroy it. You know, it's to right. buy something, to buy something whose, who's, um, you know, whose uh, end state is to be discarded. Yes. Not to be used up or recycled. So that's, you know, number one is consume. Thou shalt operate globally. You know, no regulation, no regulation, minimal taxes, um, uh, suppress wages and um, privatize anything you can, you know. 
So we well, let's go. Thou shalt not, not, not regulate. Right. Uh, thou shalt not tax or, or barely. Anyway. Or barely, yeah. Well, thou shalt not. Thou shalt spend less on labor. And thou shalt privatize. Right. These five. I think what we would call these is trends. These are secular trends, maybe, or trends in the globalization economy that have been going on for the past 20, 30 years, at, at the very least. 40, I'd say, you know. Probably 40, yeah. More. Well, let me say, by the way, pe most people date it to 1980 and the Reagan administration, but I believe it actually, it go, you can put it back into the Carter administration, in fact. Neoliberalism or the, you know, the, the idea of, outsourcing and mm. uh, free trade is not strictly a Republican um, not at all. program at all. It, everybody buy, had bought into it, you know, including the sainted Krugman, you know, who's finally come around and said, gee, maybe free trade had some problems that I hadn't thought yeah, about. Yeah, you think, you think there was a problem with NAFTA? You think there were some problems that, that hurt this country and maybe even led to our current political situation where people can take advantage of that suffering that's been going on in this country to like ways to demonize other cultures and to gain political power. I, I don't know who I'm talking about, but somebody. Comes to mind. Well, not just this country, you know, a lot of people in Mexico got hammered too. Look, look what's going on in Mexico. All these, you know, the same thing is wild. That's inequality. The, price. Right? The, the price of tortillas goes way up because suddenly people are investing in cash crops that, you know, for shipment to the U S yeah. so, you know, stuff like that. Right. So, uh, so now they've got this horrendous gangster problem. Um, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Money is like a I beg your pardon? Yeah. I've always thought money is kind of like rapid. It's like a fundamental force in our in our world that moves things and makes people do things they might not have done. It, 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 like it or not, it's 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 the basis of most of our society right now. And and, and maybe that needs to change. Yeah, the problem, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's easy to see. Yeah, sorry, I, I can't sorry, disagree sorry. with you, but but people have been making this critique, you know, for quite a long time, and yes. and it's very hard to know what to do, what else to, you know. How, yeah, I mean, uh, what, I think what that you, we are, you know, anybody who has a, do you have a four hundred one k, Larry. Uh, I was Ira. I was self-employed. Yeah, Ira or whatever. I mean, if you're invested, even if, as your book suggests, there's a way, there are sustainable uh, mutual funds, for instance, that claim to be sustainable. But if you think about it, it's still the same several major banks running those funds so that no matter what, you are feeding the beast, no matter what you invest in. Um, and I believe yeah, this leads to something of like guilt. But, uh, uh, but we are implicated. Like, I, I don't want the stock market to crash and destroy my retirement investment. But at the same time, I don't want it propped up by the government. So these are really tricky moral and ethical questions. I think. Well, the question is, what's going to get propped up by the government, isn't it? I, you know, the government right, right. Uh, right now is, I mean, they, wants to prop up the stock market. Yes. And doesn't want to prop up the guy down the street who's going to lose his apartment, you know, as soon as the eviction moratorium goes away. I'm really quite worried about my immediate surroundings, actually, uh, in the city. And, and it's in ironic. The next six months. The same forces decrying socialism, but really, what's more socialistic than the government funding the, the businesses directly? <laughs> like, that's almost like the buying corporate bonds to the tune of trillions and, and, and propping up stock valuations in service of what not not the average jail or average person well of course they make there's an argument that you know that uh that that uh, that stimulating business is good for people because it creates jobs yeah. um I, I don't know I, I mean maybe we should talk about cartooning <laughs> Yeah, well, let's do it. We can talk about it. We can, I think there is an argument for that, too. I, I think the issue is very complicated. I mean, it's really easy for people to make proclamations about what's right or wrong. What I liked about um, your book, Hypercapitalism, was it didn't talk about like systemic change. We need to change the system from above so much as it, it offered individual sort of grassroots um, 
things that you or I could try to do to, to, to change the situation over time. I like that. Yeah, well, this is uh, this is comes from Tim, of course. You know, he's plugged into a certain uh, uh, network of activists who are involved in things like that. I, um, I'm more skeptical of it than he is. I mean, we could talk about some of the items in there, like a time bank where you, mm. uh, or you know, or, or labor sharing where you form a, a group of people who. Do basically do favors for each other, but it's all uh, there's an accounting system that takes care of it, and and all hours are are uh, accounted equally, right? So nobody gets paid a higher hourly. So you train yeah. guitar lessons for carpet or something, you know? Right. Um, well, well, Larry, what you know what? What's your next? Do you have a next topic chosen yet? Well, I uh, I'm working on a book proposal, but I. Probably don't want to discuss it yet because oh, okay. we don't have it. It's you know the proposal isn't done, and, um, and it's getting close to done, but we haven't submitted it. And I don't, you know, I don't know. It's you know, almost, it, it departs from the it, two things about it. it departs from the template quite a bit uh, of the cartoon guides, which are sort of curriculum based. And the other thing is that you know it's about some social phenomena that um, that got a lot more complicated <laughs> with the pandemic ah, so, okay. you know, and also with the black lives matters uh, movement or something like that, you know i would love uh, to see like, the guide to to money or currency well, i find it a fascinating topic from natural <laughs> to don't we all <laughs> hey, i'm sorry say again don't we all yeah. Well, I mean, just from a from a phenomenon point of view, like I like money as much as anybody else, but the idea of what money truly is, the idea of how that is even changing now when we talk about cryptocurrencies and other things, um, I think would be a really interesting topic, right? Um, and and hey, speaking of cryptocurrencies, guys, hey, I don't mean to interrupt you right in the middle of the show to plug something commercial, but man, don't forget about. Pigcoin. What's Pigcoin, you ask? Oh my gosh. Pigcoin is a brand new cryptocurrency tethered to the price of a direct market periodical comic. And if past performance is any indication of future performance, which it isn't, the price of Pigcoin can only skyrocket. I mean, it started at 10 cents back in the 30s and now we're up to 399. That's over a 3,900% increase in value in just a couple of lifetimes. So, Larry. What? Yeah. Tell me. What's with the pigs? By who did your animal? Who your drooling? <laughs> oh man! Um, when I owned a comic book store, that was my mascot, and it was about. Um, um, metaphorically, I thought that I wanted my customers when they came into my store to be like a pig and shit, uh -huh. and they, I wanted them to be as happy as they could be. So pigs just sort of like followed me everywhere. Um, what did you cover the floor with? <laughs> uh, um, okay, Larry. So this is your uh, your latest book. I wish I had known about that. I'm, I apologize. So tell me the name of your latest book again, and we want to make sure we, that we plug that. Our latest book is the car. I think it's the, the cartoon guide to algebra. algebra. Algebra is the latest. Okay. Yeah. I don't have that one. I don't have a picture of that one. That one's doing um, well, and that's not you know. Uh, that's the only one of the cartoon guides that's sort of not at a beginning college level. The great thing about doing books that are at the college level is that you don't, there's no state education board, you know, telling, uh -huh. to, telling the teacher what to buy, right? The college professor can tell students what to get and they, and they do. It's entirely up to them. So there's a lot more latitude and, but um, I don't know, maybe it's homeschooling or, something but uh, this algebra book is is doing well um, well everybody has to take out right? so like i think that says a lot about why your statistics book did so well besides the quality of it it's just like, just like a lot of people need to take it and a lot of people find it difficult so i think you're doing a humongous service for those people yeah i heard i've heard stories about um, businesses that require their new hires to read the cartoon guide to statistics in fact, uh, some someone who worked at Netflix told me that that was the case there. I can't vouch for it, but I'll bet. Yeah, yeah. And I like, almost worked there. 
So we they're deep into stats. They're deep into that stuff. That is their that is their everything is is their statistics. Oh, and by the way, yeah, Borgen is on Netflix. <laughs> Just I'm Borgen, sorry, sorry. Borgen, the great Danish uh, series, the greatest Danish TV series ever made, has finally appeared on Netflix. It's from 2010. Borgen. Yeah, yeah. Dude, it's you a, give me three things. It's a post pounding TV series about coalition politics. You know? Oh, I'll check it out. I, so, so, so far, you gave me Borgen, you gave me Andrew Gelman, and you gave me Tony Mendez. So, I, these are all names I never heard of before that sound right up my alley and super interesting. Um, so I appreciate that. That one's great. You know? um, so let's see, where were we? Were we somewhere? We're all over the place, Larry. Where we are is we're ready for um, for, for a little bit of Q&A, if you are, from the viewers. We've got 17 people watching right now, and we've okay. got comments over here in the comments section, and I'll be able to bring them up. There's a few questions for Facebook, you. All my Facebook friends. Yeah. Well, I have a few of yours, a few of mine. Uh, let's see. Curious. I showed a few already, but curious. How are you fast? How long does it take to do a page, Larry? Oh man. And do you break it down? Do you do writing first for a bunch of pages, and then you yeah, writing. You know, I mean, with the writing and everything, it's long. Drawing is much faster than I used to be. Yes, I can probably, I, you know, I could probably do two pages a day, now, two a day. something like that. Yeah, two and you're working out a smaller format than, than, than most comic artists as well, right? I mean, this uh, is uh, the, the cartoon guides. That's true. Um, the uh, of course, you know, the cartoon history. I'm working normal size. Yeah, that one's a little smaller. Uh, the cartoon history is uh, normal comic. Oh, okay. Size, okay. Ten by fourteen or something. But um, you know, the other issue is that now everything gets scanned and the text, you know. It's, there's a lot of computer work also. No event, no Sky. Friend uh, of the show. Cartoonist. He's a fantastic cartoonist, by the way. If you haven't read any of it, you would like it. Um, it's very not, The answer is not many. Um, What's the latest the comic, comic? Like the most recently created comic, you say? Um, I can't remember the title. Uh, I've got it around here somewhere. It's a it's a comic on um, that advocates for open borders for immigration for, for total total uh, totally free immigration anywhere. Oh, I, I'd like to read like that too. Yeah, it's a the guy's a I think he's an economics professor who worked with a, a cartoonist to do this. I, you know, every page I'm going but but. You know, but um, right, right. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that was probably the latest. Hey, Dan, who hey, are cool art you shared earlier? Sure. Does Larry have an art rep? I, I mentioned that you can go to his website. I, I, I have my there. own art rep. Yeah. Yeah, Larry reps Larry himself. Reps. So. You just got to go to my website, and then there's a link. You, you know, basically, you have to email me. You, know, you can do that off my website, and then uh, ask for what you're interested in. I emailed Larry, told Larry, told Larry told me, <laughs> three or four different pages in the statistics guide with dice. And if you scroll back, I chose the chapter header because it's beautiful. Let's see. What do we got here? Oh, here we go. Coffee Breath, one of my oldest fans, says, gives you the, the link right here. Go check out his art from there. Uh, I'm just going to go through these guys. Uh, 30 to 40 million dead in the USSR. I'm not sure what he was responding to that. Oh. They're talking about our echo. I think that problem's a little bit fixed now that I'm trying to speak more quietly. Sorry, guys. Think you're getting feedback from my screen, from my. Did I say the wrong name? I, I probably did. I probably did. I don't know. Uh, so that socialism is death. Oh, we would expect this from somebody like who's going to post that. Greed is the problem. Okay, here we go. Hypercapitalism might be the most relevant topic ever. Fortunately, certain IV types will no doubt equate it with anti-capitalism and miss the point they might need to hear. I'm glad you said this, Peter. Peter's a regular can I, watcher. Can, can, can I interject? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk to the trolls. Um, you know, socialism, oh, yeah. socialism is yeah, dead, yeah. USSR, yeah, etc. Yeah. Um, I don't know where the idea comes from that you know the Soviet system is the only way to have government intervention that well, you know, moderates the, um, the yeah that moderates the uh, the behavior you know the 
the, the untrammeled behavior of people whose only interest is to enrich themselves, you know, and boss people around. I mean, you know, you got you got Holland, you got Denmark, you got Sweden, you got Norway, you know, oh, but Norway they're Great they're Britain. Way more. Um, so I don't see what Venezuela and the USSR really have to do with it. Well, here's the thing. Venezuela is it completely dominated by one export. The price of oil, as the price of oil goes, Venezuela's economy. And it's also been meddled in extremely by the U.S. and other countries politically, uh, in war, and in other ways. So. Yeah, I don't know. It's true, but you know anything about the career of Simon Bolivar? Mm. I mean, that, yeah. you know, he was from Venezuela. It was messed up then before we, I don't know. True. They, they, they have problems of their own making, too, I'm afraid. Um, okay, fair enough. But let's talk about the difference between. Because you were not, you're not anti-capitalist. I mean, nothing in your in this book talked about eliminating capitalism in any way. Frankly, it was all about well, trying to work within the system to sort of change the cultural mindset and the values. Right. Um, so talk about that. Right. You know, it talks about responsible business and uh, you know, and also government intervention. Both. Um, I think it's here. Let me recommend one more thing you probably never heard of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a book called The Empire of Cotton. You ever run into this book? The Empire no, I've of heard Cotton. Of well, this is an amazing book because it, it describes the first real capitalist enterprise, which were the weaving, the spinning and weaving mills in, in, in England. And the um, it turns out that the very first one, the, you know, uh, using this Arkwright mill was uh, open in 1776, which was the same year that the Wealth of Nations was published. So the point is that Adam Smith, you know, the prophet of free enterprise, never saw capitalism until ah. after the book was out. He was imagining, he was imagining, you know, free enterprise where there are these different businesses that are untrammeled and, you know, the pursuit of the business increases the social good, you know, the invisible hand and so on. But um, but in fact, what was happening was that was the British capital hand in glove with the Royal Navy was creating a business that was worldwide, right? The spinning mill didn't get its cotton from down the, down the way, right? It, it, it was coerced, you know, right. from, from India. And the so-called labor market was not a labor market. Um, they basically drafted people out of, you know, like, homes for unwed mothers and stuff, right? And orphanages. So from the very, very beginning, capitalism had this hyper aspect, um, you know, the, 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 the ultimate pursuit of, uh, of, um, of profit without regard to the well-being of the people who work with you um, is kind of baked into it. Free and enterprise that, or, you know, or, or a small business isn't like that necessarily. I mean, obviously there are some bad bosses, but you know, if you got a, if you know the people you're working with, you care about them as human beings. Um, but but the uh, the employees of these large mills were dehumanized from the beginning, and the suppliers certainly certainly so. Um, and free trade, you know, that's another one, right? Free trade, free trade was the slogan of the people who wanted to destroy the East India Company's monopoly on. The opium trade in China, they wanted to be able to compete in the opium trade, and they That's succeeded. Not. You know, there was enough of a market. You know, and the East India Company would become a dinosaur. So, so when England finally, you know, did all of its reforms in the 1830s, the upshot was that they let all the freelancers go in there to sell opium. That's what you know. That's truly what the business model, you know, the business was about. And uh, led immediately to the opium wars and and so on, you know, and, and 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 events that I will say have left a bitter taste in China's mouth for the last 150, 200 years. You know, um, they still they still suffer that humiliation of having the gunboats come up the river and force the opium down their throats. Well, well, yeah, and. Yeah. and, and 
and today we've got um you know we're all implicated in the sense that if you got an iphone or anything or electronics built in china or whatever i mean there are people that is a our, our, our number one trading partner in this country is probably the world's biggest human rights violator. How does that not implicate every single one of us in every single purchase we make of something like that from China in the repression and the stepping on the rights and everything of, of, of those folks? I'm, I'm not a fan. We're all very good at not seeing the things we don't see. Yeah. I mean, all... all you know, all thinking is based on what we do see and very little on what we don't see, even if we might know that it's there with a little bit of thinking about it. Right? I mean, it's just Good the way point. It yeah. um, um, Justin Hammond says, uh, please do something in philosophy or logic or critical thinking uh, or critical thinking. We need these in our society. Uh, working on any philosophy texts? Philosophy is something I've avoided. I, I don't. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't. I don't relate to it very well. It oh. seems like an endless series of questions with no answers, and you know, it's like I don't want to read something where every sentence I'm going, but but you know, like that, right? Um, critical thinking is an interesting one. I, a couple of years ago, I spent the better part of the term at Dartmouth in the bitter cold winter of 2018, and I. Uh, I came in as a guest teacher at um, in one of the, uh, the freshman writing uh, classes. And the way that the writing classes work at Dartmouth is that they, after the first term where they just teach them the basics of how to write an essay, then they divide up the classes into topic-based things. So this guy's class of, let's say, 18, 20 kids was, um, was about how, how to counter misinformation, you know, premises, there's an awful lot of misinformation getting spread around, you know, people are, can say anything and it's hard to check and people will swallow it. There seems to be an appetite for it. And how do you, how do you uh, counter it? And his basic approach was that you use, you teach critical thinking, you teach argument, you know, you, you work from the facts and I can't disagree that that's a good thing to do, but I, don't, I think it's been shown not to work. Hmm. You, know, you need to use propagandistic techniques. People are, if the facts don't agree with people's opinions, they will dismiss the facts. You know, well, that, they're well, very attached to their to their point of view, and they and they now have the capacity through Facebook and such like things, right, to only associate with people who think like they do. So they're constantly reinforced and only looking for facts that that you know that give confirmation bias. So I don't know what the answer is, but you know, I think you got to use storytelling and, you know, advertising techniques as horrible as it sounds. Um, you know, I mean, at some level, sometimes I think that something like religion is the only is has the answer. I'm not a religious person, you know, I'm a skeptic yeah. by by nature and upbringing and inclination. Yeah. Um, supernatural questions don't interest me but yeah. there's something about the way religion teaches and brings people together you know and so on so that it seems to me that if there were if there were some valuable you know good that could be promoted that way ecological ones for starters yeah. maybe for example you know this is the model that's well, I'm I'm with you, Larry. I mean, I, I would recommend. I don't know. I'm up. I'm up. I, I was raised Catholic, and uh, I'm not anymore. I'm an atheist. But I've recently found the Universal uh, Universal Universalist Church called UU, yeah, yeah. Um, and and that's been really um, really interesting. And, and and because the first time you go there, they're like. We just don't talk about Jesus. Don't talk about, not everybody here believes in God, and it's more about the things that you're talking about and using stories and art and things to inform, you know, moral opinions and community values. I once, I once heard a rabbi say, I don't believe in the God. You don't believe in either. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Unitarian universalism. Unitarian. Yeah. Unitarian. Well, you see, 
I think the reason you can call yourself an atheist is because you were raised in a religion. I wasn't raised in a religion, so I, mm -hmm. I don't call myself an atheist. I don't mm -hmm. care that much, even. You know, my, mm -hmm. my impression of atheists are they're people who really, who really have an emotional investment in the question. I call myself an agnostic. What do I know? You know? I'm not even an atheist. Fair. I, like, it's more like I'm almost like a pantheist. I don't know, because yeah. I believe I, I got this from a comic book that, um, that, that the God might only exist inside the mind, but that doesn't that doesn't make it any less powerful. Or in fact, it makes it more powerful of a concept, right? So that's that's where I've always come. To. Have we wandered far enough from the comic conversation yet? I don't know. Let, let, yeah, I was, I, I'm going to go back to the question about what comics have I read lately? Because uh, <laughs> I thought of a couple of good ones. Oh uh, yeah, please. Uh, uh, Rutu Modan, you know Rutu Modan, Israeli? No. Uh -uh. She's an Israeli, she's really good. Yeah, there's one called The Property. Very good. And there's the one called Exit Wounds. I'm Palestinian, so I haven't read a lot of Israeli comics. I mean, not that I wouldn't. I just haven't been exposed to it. Well, they're not particularly political. They're you know personal stories. She's very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely well, know that. They, they look kind of rotoscoped, as it were. That is to say, it looks oh. like they acted them out. She, her, her. You know, she's got that Hergé line, you know, but the characters are realistic. Oh, okay. more or less. Um, Clear line style or whatever. Yeah. Okay, um, let's see. I got a couple, just a couple more. Um, oh, Noah Van Skyver, our cartoonist, by the way. He, uh, he, he wrote um, Cartoon it. Guide to the Grateful Dead. It was a good capitalist move for me. That was a joke. He got my copy and he signed it with a pig picture. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Noah. Very nice. Nice pig. Yeah, yeah. So that's some pig. Huh? Yeah, nice pig. And that's that's uh, Noah himself. Thanks, Noah. Hi, Noah. And uh, and he knows. I know he would know. He knows we wrote to Modan. Um, Great, that's it. We're out of questions. Besides this, uh, a very cool dead interesting new crumb poster. I get to talk to Van or just management. You guys can talk to each other later. This is about Larry. Larry, I want to thank you for taking this time. Now, you were the first guy who ever totally flaked out on me on a Tuesday night interview. All right. You were the first one to break my streak. first. But that's okay because this has honestly been one of the cooler conversations I've had. I'm glad that you're willing to talk about all kinds of different stuff and. Um, Thanks for coming on Comic Book News. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Okay. I'm going to wrap this thing up. i got to play my closing credits. I know you're busy. If you could stick around, stick around. We could chat afterwards. But if not, I'll, I'll see you next time. Uh, I'm probably going to take off. I've got some family responsibilities. But uh, yeah. thanks to no you. Uh, so long, folks. Great. Good. Thank you. Thanks for the art. Uh, thanks for the artwork, and uh, I'll be in touch again soon. Maybe maybe you'd be willing to come back and do a panel discussion or something with some other uh, cartoonists? Sure. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Larry. Bye, Dan. Okay. All right, guys. That was it. That was uh, that was Larry Gonick. That was awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy how that went. Um, I think doing comics that teach people is a tricky thing. You got to strike a balance, not just between the words and the images in there, but you know, how much do you teach and how much do you entertain? It's really a form of infotainment, which I'm a fan of, because if what you're reading isn't interesting, you're less likely to absorb it. And uh, Larry hit that sweet spot, man. He dropped out of Harvard to do this thing a long, long time ago because he saw the future of what comics could 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 do for him and could do for, for other people. And he was right. Um, so speaking of other people and what they can do, thank you for watching this. Thanks for tuning into Comic Book News. Thank you, if you have, for subscribing. If you haven't, consider for a moment clicking on that little subscribe button down there. Also consider for a moment um, maybe clicking on the join button. What does the join button do? Oh, my gosh. Well, think of it this way. There's four different levels that will uh, give varying amounts of money directly to me. So think of it like money from heaven that you can just rain down on me. And doesn't that sound like fun? I don't know why you wouldn't want to do it. So think about it anyway. You'll see all the fun things that you can get, including having seen your names in the opening and or closing credits right here on Comic Book News, which we're about to do. Hey, next week, I've got Peter Maresca. Now, if you've ever read any of the books from Sunday Press, 
you know, they are the biggest books that you can buy. I've never seen a bigger book, literally. I just, there are no books bigger than the Sunday Press, certainly not with comics in them. They're full size newspaper pages. There's a whole story about how Peter rescued them from, uh, uh, from the dustbin of history, essentially. Uh, Peter's brother used to be a, um, a customer at my comic book store in San Jose, and that's how I met him and knew him and started buying the Little Nemo books and other books. He has just published so many treasures in a format that recaptures the glory of the, the, the truly like golden or even platinum age, really the platinum age, I guess, of comics and beyond. Anyway, it should be a fun interview. I hope you all tune in and check it out. Um, we got some other cool stuff coming down the pike. You're not going to believe some of the stuff I got coming on this channel soon. We've got some wackiness on its way. I'm not going to give it away. I'm just going to say thanks for tuning in. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for joining. But most of all, just thanks for watching. See you next time. Yeah!